Okay, hi and welcome once again to our talks and I welcome you to our um, uh, talk number one, which is really number two, but number one because the first one was an introduction, a summary, a briefing of the whole course. And today signifies, signifies the start of our talks and the first one. And uh, of course today's talk, uh, as we um, discussed last time in the briefing will be on uh, will be part A of the talks on um, semiology, uh, semiotics uh, and signification and all that. Okay, so I'm uh, Dr. Michael Hudson Thomas and I will be uh, you know th with you throughout the whole course and uh, if you need to um, look at anything in advance or you need to discuss anything with me about what's coming up then you know everything's in the notes so everything's um, online and uh, you can contact me uh, by email or uh, the like you know I'm always around and always ready to to come and see you or to discuss any of these things with you okay so we're going to begin today with uh, um, uh, part A of uh, semiology, and we will, um, I guess, like with everything, we'll start with very general things, and then we'll gradually work our way from the periphery to the epicenter, epicenter, to the center, and you know, uh, gradually, very gradually, develop our understandings, our concepts of how things like this work. Okay. Uh, also, I um, invite you to stop me at any time and ask me any questions and you know, discuss anything or suggest anything because I do welcome uh, interaction. Okay. All right. So, uh, semiology. Let's begin. I'm going to begin by uh, asking a few questions. Okay. As you can see on the screen or on your small screen, on your devices, uh, uh, we have a set of eight questions and question number one asks what is a sign and you know the word sign s-i-g-n question number one asks what is a sign well what is a sign um, a sign is you know if you take the everyday very general definition as we will be doing um, a sign is uh, something that signals something. Okay, a sign is something that signals something. To who? Well, a sign is then something that signals something to someone or to something. So that's a very general definition and that's a great starting point. In fact, it's an excellent starting point and we need little more to start to embark our, on our discussion of the sign. Okay, so what is a sign? And I guess we can find some um, examples to back that up and to support our understanding of what a sign is. Uh, for example, a street sign. Okay, a street sign. Very easy. A uh, street light sign, a stop sign, a street light, uh, a stop light, um, a um, crossing sign, uh, don't uh, speed because there are children, uh, beware of buffalo or kangaroos or you know uh, crocodiles or something um, uh, parking for the uh, physically challenged you know where you go to park in a in a car park and, or a parking lot and there's a wheelchair sign so you cannot park here because you get a ticket because it's reserved for those who have a special sticker or permit okay uh, s a speed sign so there's you see a sign with 40 or 60 and it, it signifies that you can only do 40 or 60. It doesn't signify, as my friends in university would say, oh, um, 60, that means we can add another 60 miles or 60 kilometers to our current speed and they'd speed up, right? Uh, or the sign, the speed hump sign, which my friends in university would, while well, I was in university many years ago, would suggest that, look, there's, it's, this says speed hump, that means that we can speed because there are humps. Great. Hmm. Okay, so there are signs which we interpret in certain ways. Uh, okay, 
Uh, a sign can be something in uh, an office that says non-smoking, a cigarette and a circle and a cross through it, signifying that no, no smoking or no eating. When you go to a restaurant, you see on the window or on taxis, you see on the window that um, stickers and the stickers have uh, drawings of cigarettes and crosses through or sandwiches and crosses through, suggesting that you cannot bring in your own food, your own burgers, you cannot smoke, <coughs> bring in your own drinks and so forth. Okay, other signs. Other signs can be anything. You know, the sun, the sun, the real sun. You look up into the sky and you see the sun. And what does the sun signify? The sun signifies, right, okay, okay, good. The sun signifies, it's, it tells us that it's a nice sunny day and uh, you know, everything's great. The birds are going to be singing and uh, people are going to be at the beach uh, swimming and uh, our crops are going to grow uh, healthily and so forth. It's not going to rain. If we see uh, uh, grey clouds, okay, okay, easy, easy. It's a sign. It's a sign that it's going to rain. Okay, okay, so they're the very basics, very basics. Um, Anything else? Does anybody want, want to suggest something that will um, push us forward a little? And we've spoken a little in the past in my um, undergraduate courses about this, so you know, you'd, you'd, you'd know. Right, okay, okay, there you go. We've spoken about this smoke, smoke. And smoke is a, a signal, signifies something, something. It signifies that um, there's a fire or, um, you know, something's hot, something's burning, you know, or something. Something's overheating. Okay. <coughs> what about sound? If you walk past a house and you're, you know, you're walking down the street and you walk past the house and you hear the piano playing and it's, it's a simple piano melody, you know, um, sort of beginner's piano. You, the sign is that there's a, somebody in there, uh, possibly a child, there's a kid, um, more than likely a kid, but you know, could be an adult, learning the piano. Okay, so you hear a ding, 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 ding. And you're going to say that, look, this is no jazz expert. It's somebody who's learning the piano. Okay. Smell. You smell um, you know, barbecue smell, and you automatically uh, or frequently assume that uh, somebody's having a barbecue in their backyard and friends over and a party or something. Okay. Okay. All right. So, question number two: Where do signs occur? Well, um, where do signs occur? Uh, initially, our initial ideas of the whereabouts of signs, the location of signs, is that they occur on the street and on windows, restaurant windows, and walking past houses. We hear uh, a piano sound and um, you know barbecue smells on buses, but uh, signs, uh, actually, the more we understand the sign, the more we understand the sign, the more we realize that the sign is ubiquitously um, pervasive of everything. Everything and absolutely everything uh, in um, uh, our uh, life worlds is a sign. Everything that does anything and anything that exists exhibits a sign. Okay, signs are everywhere and every, everywhere, um, everywhere and everything are signs. So the more we understand the sign, the more we understand that signs are everywhere. Okay, and the more we um, understand signs, the more we understand how to create signs. Okay, there's a key word, creating signs. Who creates signs? Well, we create signs, and the signs create us. But, you know, okay. We'll speak about that later. We'll get into that much later. So signs are everywhere. Signs are everywhere. Omnipresent. Why do we employ signs? Question number three. Why do we employ signs? Why? Well, I think maybe a better question there would be, um, why uh, do we have to employ signs? Why must we employ signs? 
Okay. Um, it's an uh, it's an absolute um, requirement that we uh, employ science, uh, and we do all the time. Everything we do, every second, every split second of our um, long line of impressions throughout our lives is about employing signs in some way or another. We produce signs, we reproduce them, we re, uh, um, uh, re uh, um, uh, interpret them, we, uh, you know, we make sense of signs in an uh, in infinite number of ways and we continuously change our interpretation of the sign. So why? Um, because that's uh, the law of the, the universe. Our lives are about, are about um, employing signs. Okay, the sign is everything. The sign, which becomes a text, uh, is everything. And there's nothing but the sign, the text. Okay, so there's nothing away from or outside of the text, the sign because everything is the sign. All right. How do we employ signs? Well, okay, there's another great question. How do we employ signs? We employ signs by uh, applying what we know. And we can only apply what we know. If we don't apply what we know, then the sign doesn't work. For example, if we uh, come to uh, an intersection, two roads uh, crossing each other, and um, you know, at 90 degrees, it's an intersection, and we look up and there are three colors um, flashing in sequence, uh, not together, but in sequence. There's a red one, uh, an orange one, and a green one, and we see a red one and we don't know what that means, then um, we cannot employ it. We cannot use the sign. But uh, when we know what it means, when we've been told, when we've learned to interpret the sign, then we can employ it. So how do we employ it? By uh, having already interpreted the sign. Having learnt what the sign is signifying. Signifying. Okay. Uh, by interpolating, by putting things together. Saying, hmm, there's a burger, which I know, and there's a circle with a line through it, which I know, which means not. So that must mean no burgers. Okay, so we put two things together and produces uh, some sort of sign. Uh, without being able to recognize, to interpret, to interpolate, then uh, we cannot produce the sign, and the sign doesn't have any production, or at least the wrong production. Okay. So if we see a, a squiggly, squiggly, squarey thing, and uh, we've never seen it before, we can say, hmm, that's a squiggly, squarey thing, and it has some bubbles on the right side and some um, horizontal lines on the left. And I've never seen one of those before, so I, I, I don't know what it means. So it's not a sign yet. It's not yet a sign. It's only a sign when we can interpret it in some way, in some way. Okay. Now the question is, even if we cannot interpret it, and interpreting it very wrongly uh, uh, with respect to what we know, does that make it a sign? Okay, question number five. Question number five is, who employs signs? Who employs signs? Well, um, you know, you have gathered by now, uh, does anybody have a response to this? Does anybody have a response? Because this is very easy, very easy. Um, yeah, uh, okay, we all do? Right, we all do, we all do. Everybody, everybody and everything uh, employs signs. Everybody and everything. We do not live out without employing signs. Our lives are about signs. Okay. So everybody and everything employs signs in one way or another, or in many ways, or in many others, because, you know, uh, signs are everything. Uh, question six. Question six? You can see question six here. Yeah? Uh, what combinations do signs emerge in? And these responses are, you know, they're not very helpful, are they? they, they um, they're making things more confusing or increasing our confusion in some way. But what combinations do signs emerge in? Uh, well, the response to that is that um, 
an infinite number of combinations. And we'll, you know, we'll understand that gradually, especially as we get to post-structuralism, because post-structuralism is about the infinite combination of signs and infinite um, propagation of the sign. But anyway, not to confuse things, uh, I will now um, tell you that signs uh, emerge in or uh, appear in or become an infinite number of combinations. You know, they combine, they recombine, they propagate. Signs just keep on reproducing themselves. However, just to be simple now, just to be simple, let's say that signs uh, appear in one form, then we change perspective and we see things in another form, in another way. So, you know, signs recombine to uh, represent themselves in different ways. For example, okay, for example, let's say you see uh, a red cross and, you know, in some countries, not all countries, but in some countries, uh, the Red Cross represents uh, an ambulance or a hospital or something, or first aid. And, you know, you know it's first aid. Uh, and you know it means medicine. So if you get sick or you need to, you see a, a truck with a Red Cross, you know, get out the way because the sirens are flashing and there's somebody sick and they need an express route to hospital. However, um, if you work in a hospital and, or if one of your um, beloved people, friends, family, uh, has gotten sick, and you see the, and you know, and the consequences have uh, consequences have been adverse, then you um, you wouldn't see it very positively. You'd say, okay, this reminds me of something very bad, and you know, something bad happened, and I don't like the sign. Uh, or if you've had a bad experience in hospital, it's not such a positive thing. Now, if you live in um, uh, some uh, non-Christian countries which do refuse to employ the sign, the Red Cross, then uh, you may not recognize this because uh, it's, um, you know, it pertains to the uh, medical industry in Christian countries. Non-Christian countries have other forms. Okay. A flag. If you choose a flag of the world, a flag of the world, um, you know, let's say you choose uh, uh, the flag of um, the United States, uh, which has stars and stripes, 50 stars and 13 stripes. And you, the first time you look at it, you think, okay, that's pretty, you know, red and white and blue, okay, it's quite, the contrast is quite strong. There's red, white, and blue, and the contrast is very strong. You know, red is not like blue, and blue is not like white, and red is not like white. But then you begin to learn about the United States and the history, and you, you, you understand that originally the United States was 13 states, comprised 13 states, and now it comprises 50. Okay, 50, very good, very good. Who said that? All right, 50. Uh, so you understand that. But then, uh, you, then you start to learn more about the United States, and you realize that there was a civil war, and the civil war was about um, uh, moving to a unified set of regions, states, and it moved through to 13, then to 50. So this is some sort of transition. Okay. Then you learn about the Civil War, and you know that the Civil War was quite bloody, and people died, and, um, you know, in the, these... Um, and, of course, America has been engaged in lots of um, other wars throughout the years, in, you know, throughout the 20th century and even now. And, you know, there have been um, issues in the United States, including 9-11, uh, which was about nationalism and uh, the nation, the American nation. So then you, you know, you become uh, familiar with these events and you live through these events and everything and you have friends who were in um, New York at 9-11 and I certainly did. I had uh, relatives and friends and you um, then the flag takes on a new meaning for you uh, whether it's a positive or a negative meaning it takes on new meaning okay by its affiliation with certain uh, motives motives all right so the flag itself changes, changes its sign, 
as we learn about the environment um, related, connected to the flag. Okay. Uh, question number seven. Um, are signs real? Are signs real? Well, in fact, the answer for that is, do we have any yeses? Any noes? The answer for that is yes and no. Yes and no. Because uh, reality is, you know, what is reality? What is reality? I don't know if you've seen a, a great movie uh, that I've seen, and it's one of my favorite movies, and one of my favorite actors. There's a guy, an actor called John Cusack. And John Cusack had um, a movie years back now, I don't know, six years, seven years, eight years back, uh, 1408, 1408. Okay, 1408 was a thriller um, come horror, and it was a great film. And the 1408 was about, uh, you've seen it, right? Yeah, yeah. 1408 was about John Cusack, who was um, a, a writer, um, uh, a writer, a horror uh, story writer, but he documented real uh, haunted places. And um, uh, he had visited, he was given a, a sign uh, a note to visit a hotel in New York and he went to the, the Dolphin Hotel and he stayed in the room 1408 and he experienced all these things and in the end he, um, he, there was a recording of all of his experiences and all these signs that he received and um, the recording was empty, 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 just his voice, just his voice and none of the things that he experienced were recorded except for one thing and that was the recording of his already dead daughter, uh, who had died of cancer, I believe. I don't know. Who had died of cancer. And, you know, his uh, feelings for his daughter were so strong that, you know, somehow that became a reality in the room, the room 1408. And the room, you know, the whole discussion of the room 1408 is, is a good discussion. It's very interesting. And, you know, one day when we have time and you feel like discussing it, we will discuss the cosmological precepts of 1408 and everything. But the point is that he, um, he recorded everything and nothing was real except for his daughter. So what was real to him was his daughter. And then afterwards, um, other people heard the recording and they did hear his daughter, whereas they did not hear anything else. I can't remember his name. Um, uh, I think his name was, it was Michael, 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 Michael something. Michael, it was a... Uh, uh, his, interestingly, I think, I could be wrong, but his name was um, taken from um, a great author, a real great author. Uh, I'll remember in a second, I'll let you know. Okay, Michael, Michael. Uh, the name the names doesn't, has, doesn't come to me. Okay, so the last question, uh, what are sign environments? What is a sign environment? You know, the sign environment is you know, it's really about two things. It's really about the author, the party, the agent producing the sign, and the audience, the agent um, interpreting, receiving and interpreting the sign. Okay. Uh, it's also about the histories of both, more so the histories of the audience, the interpreter. Uh, but it's about, you know, the... Um, the agency and the uh, environment of the author and the agency and environment of the audience. Okay. And you know I'm trying to remember that name of Michael, 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 you know, you'll get it. I, one of you will Google it and, you know, you'll get it. Um, it'll come to me. Okay, so sign environments are really the uh, histories and the, and uh, when we say history we can um, suggest culture because culture is the social lineage through time, the diachronic, diachronic cu cultural lineage, uh, diachronic social lineage of a group of people, and uh, the uh, the physical environment, the cycle. There's a word I don't like to use, but I do use it, um, you know, carefully. The psychological environment of 
um, a community of the person. Okay. The site environment is the environment of the uh, production of the site in one way or another. Okay. Okay, so now I'm showing you two pictures. So there are two pictures. And uh, these two pictures are uh, of two different things. Now these two different things are, um, uh, you know, you look at the left one and you see a book. And the book is made of paper, of course. Okay, so when you see the book made of paper, uh, you think of a certain thing. And when you look at the one on the right, the iPad, the Apple iPad, it's the big one and the medium one and the small one, then you think of something else. Okay. Now, of course, the book uh, has been around uh, for uh, many hundred years. And uh, we know what the book is and its worth. And of course, the book has been worth, the idea of the book has been worth uh, a great deal to um, society, to the world. It has given us much, as has the iPad. The iPad is a great device. It really is. You know, it's a real machine. It does a great job. It has revolutionized uh, the way we do what we do. Okay. Now, when we look at the book, uh, it's made of paper and it has print text on there. Uh, the f first thing we think of is study. Okay. Or you know, you sit down and you learn something and you get information from this. Uh, what is the book? What does the book tell you? I would like to hear from you. Okay, okay. Right, okay. There you go. Study, study. What else? Knowledge, right? Knowledge. Uh, more, more. Um, yeah, you know, we've discussed this, so you're right. You're right, so you know already. It signifies power, power. You know, people who uh, print books, uh, have certain have power and they disseminate their information through these books. Good, good response. You know. Okay, it's yeah. Well, there you go. It's a sign. It's a sign. It's it's actually um, not just one sign, but uh, an infinite number of signs uh, put together in various combinations, permutations, and so forth, and it becomes you know an infinite um, source of a source of infinite. Uh, an infinite number of signs. What else does it, does it tell us? What's the sign there? Wow, okay, very good, very good. Yeah, it signifies oldness, oldness. Antiquity, I don't know, antiquity, not so uh, antique. But yeah, you know, when I was doing my undergraduate and postgraduate days, uh, uh, graduate study in my undergraduate and postgraduate days, it was about books and paper and nothing electronic. I think um, when I was finishing my undergraduate or beginning my master's, um, well, there was one kid, my, yeah, my undergraduate, um, my first undergraduate, there was one kid who had a computer and the rest of us didn't. You know, and he had, he had gotten the software and everything and he produced his um, work using the software and he had all these models and graphs and everything. And, you know, I think somewhat unfairly, he was given great marks because his work was great. The rest of us, it was pencil and paper and everything. And, you know, um, our grades were not uh, the same as his, but uh, apparently he deserved it because his uh, work was done wonderfully. So having a, a computer back then was a luxury and it also a gateway to, uh, to uh, success. But yes, the, the book, the paper print book signifies oldness, oldness, you know, days of old. It does. That's a great sign. You know, if you have a book, um, it means that you were, li were living a long time ago, possibly, 